and I, I look at things and, and there's a little pamphlet that I don't know if any of you get from Perry F. Rockwood. Now, he's just a blessing. I just love this guy. He's 87 years old and he's still preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. People ask him, when are you going to retire? He says, I'm going to quit when the devil quits. And uh, because there's work to be done. There's a gospel that needs to be preached. And, and he's a real blessing. He's up in uh, Canada, Nova Scotia. And uh, he does a great job of preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. He also does a lot of teaching on the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he defends God's word, the authorized version, the Holy King James Bible. And so I, I subscribe, I support his ministry, and I, I get a, a pamphlet that he prints every month. It's just a little paper thing called the People's Gospel Hour Standard or something like that. And in it, there was just this little, on the bottom of one page, seven lines that said the, the fundamentals of Christianity. And, and it was just nothing more than just an outline of seven things. And I looked at that outline and I said, that is an awfully good teaching. I'm going to go through the scriptures and just bring this out and teach it. So for the next few weeks, I want to begin talking to us about the fundamentals of the Christian faith. Now, I want to say a few things before we get started. Um, I'm not a fundamentalist. Okay? I'm not a Baptist. I am a born-again, John chapter 3, uh, Bible-believing, that would be 1 Thessalonians 2.13, uh, 2 Timothy 3.16, Christian, Acts 11.26, uh, 1 Peter 4.16, uh, born-again, Bible-believing Christian. Born of the Spirit, when I received the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior. Bible-believing, when I believed that Jesus... God the Father and the Holy Spirit have given unto us an authorized version of the Holy Bible in English. And I'm a Christian because I'm in Christ and Christ is in me. And so when people ask me, you know, what religion are you? What faith are you? What are you this? I'm a born again, Bible believing Christian. I'd be more than happy to, to talk to you about the faith that I have in the Lord Jesus Christ based upon the Word of God. However, there are, there are people that uh, call themselves fundamentalists. We've probably heard the name on probably television or read it in a newspaper article. Or some people will proclaim themselves to be fundamentalists. There are people that claim to be evangelicals. Um, that's another group. The fundamentalists came before the evangelicals. Fundamentalism started about turn of the last century, around eight, late 1800s, early 1900s. Evangelicalism started around the 1940s, 1950s. Both of those groups are too liberal for me. Okay, they're just they're just too liberal for me. For, as a matter of fact, this is two of a four volume set that was written in 1917, 1920. I don't remember when it was. I'll check it here for you so I don't get it wrong. Uh, okay, it, it, they began the work in 1909. Was when the work was begun, and I think it was finally finished sometime in the teens. There, I might have it on one of these pages here. Uh, 1917 was it was originally so it took about an eight year work this work was begun uh, a long time ago about a century ago by um, a couple of Christian men um, and Dr. Torrey I don't know if you've ever heard of R.A. Torrey R.A. Torrey was the disciple of Dwight L. Moody Dwight L. Moody began his work in Chicago, began the Moody Institute and the uh, church that's up there, and Torrey was his disciple, and Torrey was a very, um, by nature, a very scholarly man. Dwight L. Moody, L. Moody was a very plain and a simple man. He was not scholarly, but uh, he loved the Lord. He loved the Word of the Lord. He preached the Word of the Lord, but this man was a scholarly. And uh, they began, uh, Tory and an associate of his, uh, Dr. A.C. Dixon, and another man, Dr. Lewis Meyer, began to work uh, to put together a four-volume set called The Fundamentals. That's just what it's called, The Fundamentals. Uh, they began to do this for the expressive purpose that... The Word of God was being heavily attacked. Uh, the Word of God started attacking it after he wrote it. It started in the garden with the devil. And it's been attacked ever since. And uh, when Jesus was here, they attacked the Word of God. When uh, the Apostle Paul was writing epistles to the Thessalonians, they attacked the Word of God. Did you ever read Second Thessalonians? 
Okay, you read about an epistle as if by us somebody forged an, uh, a counterfeit a copy of an epistle, put Paul's name to it. So counterfeits of the scriptures have been going on from the moment God begins to reveal his word, Satan gets in and corrupts the word. So these men uh, were attempting to defend, if you were, will the uh, word uh, of God. Uh, they wanted to make... Uh, copies of this. They got a Christian businessman that said that we were able to bring these volumes uh, were sent and these volumes were sent to 300,000 ministers and missionaries and workers in different parts of the world. And the purpose of it was the, uh, to defend the fundamentals of the faith. It's a, a good purpose, I believe. One of the saddest things is I got into volume two here on the inspiration of the Bible definition, extent, and proof I mean, I didn't get too far before I'm marking it up with errors because let me just share some of them with you before we get into this study. Number one, uh, inspiration, they say, is not a revelation. Um, the first definition they give. No scripture, just a, a, a nice scholarly paragraph. Inspiration is not revelation. Well, the truth is that revelation from God is what inspires the writers. Turn to Revelation chapter 1. Everything we know about truth is revealed by God. If it were not a direct revelation from God, we would not know truth. We cannot discern or discover truth through our senses by scientific method, empirical method. We've studied that before. We cannot discern truth through our mind and what would be known as rational reasoning processes of philosophy. The only way we can know truth is if God reveals it. Uh, revelation 1, verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, this is going to reveal Jesus, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants which uh, things which must shortly come to pass. He sent and signified it. He signed it like he signed his name to it by his angel unto his servant John to who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ of all things that he saw. The revelation was an inspiration given to to, to, to John, and based on that inspiration, he wrote it down. He inscribed it. So, revelation leads to inspiration, and in some cases, inspiration will lead to inscription. So, they were wrong on their first point. Second point, they said, uh, inspiration is not illumination. This is what they're saying. Uh, turn to Job chapter 32. Job chapter 32. This is how I have to read books. I read books and I have to correct them with the Word of God. Even books written by good, godly Christian men who are quote-unquote scholars. Which is their mistake? Except ye be as children, you shall not see the kingdom of God. You shall not enter into the kingdom of God. It is being a child in simplicity. I, Paul said that he was concerned unless the, you be beguiled like Eve from the simplicity in Christ. It's a simple relationship, not a scholarly relationship. So, so here he says, inspiration is not revelation. We saw he was wrong there. Inspiration is not illumination. Job chapter 32, uh, verse 8. But there is a spirit in man, okay? And the inspiration of the Almighty giveth them understanding. So inspiration is illumination. You cannot, be <coughs> excuse me, you cannot be illuminated to or understand truth without God giving you the understanding by His inspiration. So they were wrong on that one too. Inspiration is not human genius. I finally agree with them. But then the next sentence they say, but the latter, human genius, is a natural qualification. In other words, you need to be a genius in order to be inspired. <laughs> Let's turn to Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. So whenever you read a book in my library, you'll find all kinds of red checks next to certain sentences and it'll say, see such and such scripture. <laughs> Acts chapter 4. So inspiration is not human genius, but the latter human genius is simply a natural qualification. No, it's not a qualification that's needed. Uh, Acts chapter 4, verse 13. Now when they, the Pharisees, saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. You don't need to be a genius to be with Jesus. All you need to do is be with Jesus. <laughs> and, and, and you'll have inspiration. Natural genius is not required. 
Then the, then the next thing they said in, in part four is uh, when we speak of the Holy Spirit coming on men in order to write the Bible, uh, it'd be understood that the object is not the inspiration of the men, but the books. In other words, the men were not inspired, but only the books were sp inspired. The writers were not inspired, only the writings were inspired. Well, turn to Job chapter 27. Let's see if they're correct. Job chapter 27. Again, it would seem the scriptures don't, don't agree with them. Job chapter 27. I'm not a fundamentalist. They're too liberal for me. I'm reading through the book, The Fundamentals, and, and I'm correcting it with Scripture. All of They're too liberal. They use too much of their own mindset rather than the Scriptures. Job chapter 27, looking at uh, verse uh, number... Uh, let's start at the top. One. Moreover, Job continued his parable. As God liveth, who hath taken away my judgment, and the Almighty who hath vexed my soul, he was in a time of judgment. All the while my breath is in me, and the Spirit of God is in my nostrils. My lips shall not speak wickedness, nor my tongue utter deceit. You know what he's saying? He's saying, when God's Spirit is in me, I have to speak right. In other words, the inspiration of God causes my tongue to speak a certain way. He just said, it wasn't the men, it was the books. No, it was the men. The men were inspired. When God wanted to use a man to write his book, first he placed inspiration in him. As the man was inspired, all, notice again, all the while, verse 3, all the while my breath is in me and the Spirit of God is in my nostrils. When the Spirit of God is also in there, my lips shall not speak wickedness. All, he, all you can speak when God's Spirit is in you, if God's Spirit is working through you at that moment, is the Word of God. Now, there's times you, as a Christian, will quench the Spirit of God, grieve the Spirit of God, vex the Spirit of God, not give place to the Spirit of God. You'll speak your own spirit. But if you will allow the Spirit of God to have His way, you'll only speak truth. That's all the Spirit can do. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. This is all... I'm setting you up for this teaching we're going to do, but I just want you to understand I'm a born-again, Bible-believing... Christian. I believe there's a Bible right now that I can put my hands on. Here it is. It's not 2,000 years old. It's not lost in originals. We'll catch that in a second. It's right here. And we're seeing that the first four things they're saying about the writing of the Bible don't line up with the Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, uh, verse 3. Wherefore, I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed. And that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord but by the Holy Ghost. In other words, it's the inspiration that causes you to say the right thing. When, when you were at the point near salvation, when God was drawing you, His Spirit was working on you, His Spirit was working around you, and His Spirit was working in you to draw you to the truth. Like it says in the Gospel of John, when the light cometh, then you either can receive the light or reject the light. That meant if you love darkness, you reject the light, you flee from it. But if you enjoy the light, you come to the light, that your deeds may be manifest that they are wrought in God. And one of the first deeds you'll do as you come to the light is you will confess, ah, Jesus is the Lord. And you cannot do that without the Spirit of God moving in you. The Spirit of God will inspire the right speech out of you. Death and life is in the power of the tongue. And you either have a lively tongue given by the Spirit of life or you have a deadly tongue given by the father of murderers and lies. So, so inspiration, the men were inspired when they were speaking the words of God. And then somebody nearby would inscribe and write those words down, as we saw with uh, Jeremiah and Baruch in the book of Jeremiah. Then the last thing they say is, let it further be stated in this definitional connection, for the record, once and for all, the inspiration is only in the original record. In other words, the Hebrew and the Greek. Well, I, I'd have to disagree with this. First off, I'll take you to a few scriptures. Go to 2 Timothy 3.16. 2 Timothy 3.16. And I want to show you some things. I'll uh, show you why I'm not a fundamentalist. But I'm going to show you the fundamentals of the faith. But, but first I want to set this up. 2 Timothy 3.16. Verse 15. Just to show you. Timothy, from the time you were a child, thou hast known the Holy Scriptures. Timothy lived around 40, 50, 60, 70 A.D. A.D. 
He grew up with a Jewish mother. The Jewish mother only had Old Testament Jewish scriptures in 40, 50, 60 A.D. Do you honestly think she had the original Hebrew scriptures? Does anyone here honestly think she had what Moses wrote in 1400 B.C.? What did she have? She had some kind of a copy of a copy of a copy of what Moses wrote. Verse 16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Only the originals are inspired, says the fundamentalist. It says all scripture. Folks, let me ask you a question. Do you believe what you're holding in your hand is scripture? Oh, yes, I'm a Christian. Well, then it's given by inspiration to God. Okay. Well, then I don't believe it's uh, really... Uh, uh, then, then what are you here for? Close the book and go do something else on a Sunday. Why waste a good Sunday? Let's be honest. What's the point? If there's no word of God, close the book and go out and do what you were doing before you got saved and continue to do it. Otherwise, as a newborn babe, desire that you would know the sincere milk of the word and all scripture is given by it. This is scripture right here. And every word of God is pure. Now, let me show you. The word original is not found in the Bible, but the word copy is. Copies are what God gives. Go to Deuteronomy 17. and do a quick study with you. And then we'll get to the fundamentals. But I want to show you why I'm not a fundamentalist. They're too liberal. I'll tell you about a TV program I saw about eight years ago with some fundamentalists on it. Deuteronomy 17. Only the originals are inspired, says the fundamentalist. Deuteronomy 17. Verse 18. This is when you finally come into the land. Verse 14. When thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Verse 18. And it shall be when he, the king, sitteth upon the throne of his kingdom, that he shall write him a copy of this law in a book out of that which is before the Levites. And it shall be with him. And he shall read therein all the days of his life that he may learn to fear the Lord his God and to keep all the words of this law and these statutes to do them. Now, God didn't say when the king gets on the throne, give him the original. He said, give him a copy. And in that copy are all the words that I've given. Copy is a Bible word. Original is not a Bible word. So when someone comes along and starts talking about the originals, you say, can you give me a chapter and verse? You can't find anywhere a chapter and verse with original. Copies. That's all God's ever given. Folks, there are no originals on planet Earth. There never were originals on planet Earth. Where are the originals? Psalm 119, verse 89. What does it say in Psalm 119, verse 89? Turn there quickly. Psalm 119, verse 89. The originals were never placed on planet Earth. Psalm 119, verse 89. This is the middle verse of the longest psalm in the Bible, and this psalm is all about the Bible. And look what it says. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. The originals are in heaven. They've always been in heaven. They'll always be in heaven. God would never put the originals on planet Earth. All he ever gave down here were copies of copies of copies. Moses, I'm going to give you a copy of what's in heaven. Now listen to what I say here. Write it down in Hebrew. Paul, I'm going to give you some copies of what's in heaven. Listen to what I say. Write it down in Greek. Okay, you guys over there in England, I'm going to give you a copy of what's in heaven. Listen and write it down in English. God works in threes. Hebrew, Greek, and English. And all he ever gave were copies. He never gave the originals on planet Earth. He wouldn't trust them down here. He knows what a mess it is down here. So he gives copies. That's all he gave. And the king, write a copy. Uh, go to Joshua chapter 8. We'll look at some scripture. I'm not a fundamentalist. I'm a Bible-believing Christian. I believe the Bible. God's given us a Bible. I'm reading <laughs> to you from the Bible that He's given us. Joshua 8, verse um, 32. Joshua enters the Holy Land, verse 32, and he wrote there upon the stones a copy of the law of Moses, which he wrote in the presence of the children of Israel. God works with copies down here. That's all He works with. Turn to Proverbs chapter 25. Proverbs chapter 25. After that, we'll go to Luke 4 and we'll look what Jesus says. Proverbs 25. Verse 1. These are also... 
Proverbs of Solomon, which the men of Hezekiah, king of Judah, copied out. What you're about to read in this chapter did not exist in the book of Proverbs until Hezekiah copied them out. Because it was time for them to be copied, and God said, okay, Hezekiah, copy these out, put them in there. When God's ready, He gives a copy to someone. In His timing, when the fullness of time in God's mind comes, He gives copies. He rains the manna down piecemeal as He's ready. It's God's work. So, Jesus, in Luke chapter 4, Jesus in Luke chapter 4, living centuries after Moses has written, centuries after Isaiah has written, centuries after even Malachi has written, the last writer of the uh, Old Testament, lived 400 B.C. And Jesus comes four centuries later, and here's what happens. Uh, Luke 4, verse 16. And when He, Jesus, came to Nazareth, now He's beginning His ministry, He's been baptized in the Spirit, He came to Nazareth where He had been brought up, as His custom was, He went in, to the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he opened the book, he found the place where it was written. Now, I just want to stop for a second. I just want to stop. Who's Isaiah? It's Isaiah. It says the book of the prophet Isaiah. The book. So, so what do you think that was? Do you think that was the book that Isaiah wrote 600 years before? You don't really think that, do you? You don't want to know why you don't? Where's the temple? Jerusalem. Where's Jesus? In a synagogue in Nazareth. And yet, the Holy Spirit tells Luke to write down that this is the book of Isaiah. Why? Because it's got all the words perfectly in it. Every word is pure. And Jesus read out of a copy of a book. And he read through the entire thing and uh, verse 20, and he closed the book and he gave it again to the minister and he sat down and the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened upon him and he began to say, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. This thing I just read out of his scripture. Because all scripture is given by inspiration of God, even copies of copies of copies. Because my father has chosen to give the copies and only copies and let copies of copies be made and he would preserve them all. Turn to Psalm chapter 12. Psalm chapter 12. My father keeps the originals up in heaven, but he gives copies down here and he preserves the copies. Psalm chapter 12. Now, this is an interesting chapter in the Psalms because we quote the 6th and the 7th verse. The words of the Lord are pure words. Has silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them. Thou shalt keep them. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Preservation is God's work, not man's work. So the next thing the guy says is, here he is attempting to defend the faith and the fundamentals. He says, some years ago, a liberal theologian deprecating the Bible remarked that it's... Uh, now, here's what he's saying. They're deprecating the fact that over time, the Bible has scribal errors entering into it. And so the liberals saying, what a big deal it is that you guys read books that have scribal errors in them, and you want to say that's uh, so important. He says, well, it is important because the originals were right, even if we have broken copies today. And the liberal says, wow, that's a great deal. I mean, what matter does it if a, a pair of trousers were originally perfect if now they're running around and they have holes in them and they're rent? That's a good point. You want to wear something that's got holes in it? You want your robe of righteousness to have holes in it? And then he says, then a fundamentalist stood up, the witty Dr. James Burrell, and replied, it might be a matter of small consequence to the wearer of the trousers, but the tailor who made them would prefer to have it understood that they did not leave his shop that way. This is a defense of the faith? That's a pretty sad defense of the Word of God. So well, they were perfect a long time ago, but now we have broken copies. <laughs> it's an erroneous defense. Because God said He'd preserve it. And Jesus read out of it and said, This day is the Scripture here. And then Jesus said in John chapter 10, where He said, I am the good shepherd. Look what He says later in that 10th chapter. Because a good shepherd keeps things. He not only keeps His flock, He keeps the Word of God. And He says in, in John chapter 10, verse 35, 
if he called them gods unto whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken. He puts a little a positive in there, a definite imperative statement. The scripture cannot be broken. Heaven and earth can pass away, but my words cannot pass away. The copies that my fathers put down here are preserved. Oh yeah, there are corrupt ones too. And if you want to read them, be my guest. But the, the, there are correct ones. So a fundamentalist to me is he's just too liberal. Okay, I, I can't, I mean, I saw this program about eight years ago. Now look, at, here's the way it works. You ever read the, in Revelation about the New Jerusalem? We're going to live in the New Jerusalem. Physically. One day, you and I are going to live in the New Jerusalem. Did you read about the New Jerusalem? There's that beautiful city. There are streets of gold like on a, sh a clear glass. And the light of God lights it. And it shines right through the glass. And, you know, like we studied in our same... New Jerusalem never is on planet Earth. It hovers above Earth like a space station. And it hovers above Earth. And, and the light of God shines down like the sun. And the Earth basks in the light of the New Jerusalem hovering above, above Earth. Okay, that's why the clear glass... Uh, we talked about all that. But And then there's the temple. God himself is in there. And then there are the buildings and the mansions we live in. But do you remember what was around the city? Walls. Walls. The foundations were around the, the city. There were walls. God did not make it a wallless city. God has given you walls to your faith, a foundation to your faith, a shield to your faith that compasses you round about. The shield of faith, Ephesians chapter 6. It's the Word of God. It's the wall that's around you. And I watched these fundamentalists on a TV show about eight years ago. Dr. Kennedy, D. James Kennedy, had John MacArthur and R.C. Sproul and a bunch of fundamentalists. And, and these very guys that believe that only the originals were inspired, so they've taken the walls down, are now running around trying to say, but I've given you the walls, but you can't have this precious little fundamental stone. I've still got this one. I still believe in the virgin birth. Oh, and I still believe in the resurrection. And I still believe in salvation by grace. Oh, I may not believe the words of that book are true anymore, but you can't take this stone from me. And I thought it was so pathetic to watch them retreating and guarding a few precious stones inside rather than just having the walls to protect them. And say, it is written. Thus saith the Lord. I'm a born-again Bible-believing Christian. Now, within the New Jerusalem, there are some fundamentals. There are some precious stones within the city. But I'm not taking the walls down to believe those fundamentals. I'm keeping the walls up too. I got the, the shield of faith. It's the authorized, holy King James Bible where the word of a king is there's power. Remember in Deuteronomy, who's supposed to copy the book of the law? A king. A king. Not a translation committee. A king. God hath chosen a king. How do you know, how do you know which Bible's God? Someone asked me. I said, it's real simple. The simplicity of Christ. In the Old Testament, there's a book called Kings. In the New Testament, there's a book called James. Try that with any other quote-unquote version out there. It's God's Bible. So first, I want you to understand that's what I believe. Jesus is the Christ. The King James is the Bible. Now, you want to go inside and study some fundamentals? There are some precious fundamentals within the holy city there. Those precious fundamentals are very exciting to study. But I don't need to guard them. The wall's going to guard them for me. Heaven and earth will pass away, but these words will not pass away. Someone want, you want to know what the fundamentals are? Go to the book. Go to the book. So we're going to spend some time in the next few weeks. I'm going to show you the seven fundamentals of the Christian faith. As a matter of fact, I'll put the first one up there today. We may even get to study it a little bit. We're running short on time. The first one is, the first fundamental of the Christian faith is redemption. 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 Redemption is to, to deliver from bondage. To deliver from someone who's in prison, to deliver them from the bondage of prison by a purchase, a repurchasing. Redemption. And redemption comes, Colossians chapter 1 and verse 14. There's only one way that redemption comes according to the Christian faith, according to that which is written in the Word of Scripture, which cannot be broken. Colossians 1 and verse 14. The 14th verse tells us, In whom we have redemption 
through His blood, even the forgiveness of sin. Going back to the 12th verse, We give thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of His dear Son, in whom we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sin. Redemption, one of the fundamentals, is redemption through His blood. Colossians 1.14 this is, this is very, very important. Why redemption? There's going to be need for redemption. A need for repurchase. Go all the way back to Genesis chapter 6. We'll look at the need. Genesis chapter 6. Verse 11. The earth also was corrupt before God and the earth was filled with violence. Sounds like the nightly news. And the, and the high schools today. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted His way upon the earth. All flesh had corrupted God's way upon the earth. All. No exceptions. There is a need for redemption. Redemption was provided because there was a need. Had there been no need, there'd be no provision. But God saw the need. All flesh has corrupted God's way upon the earth. Turn to uh, 1 Kings chapter 8. By the way, this is a great study sometimes if uh, you guys want to study on your own. You look at this 1 Kings chapter 8. <laughs> 1 Kings chapter 8, they're building the temple. And the temple was where God kept His name in the Old Testament. And the Bible is where God keeps His name now in the New Testament. There's no temple. And... Uh, 1 Kings chapter 8 has 66 verses and your Bible has 66 books. And in those 66 verses, you will find just about every important Bible doctrine. And let me just show you the one we're looking at here. 1 Kings 8 and verse 46. If they sin against thee, he's praying, watch this in parentheses, for there is no man that sinneth not. All flesh has corrupted God's way upon the earth. There is no man that sinneth not. The first fundamental of the Christian faith is redemption through Christ's blood because there's a serious need. Old Testament and New Testament. Romans 3. Romans 3, verse 23. All flesh has corrupted God's way on the earth. There is no man that sinneth not Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and have come short of the glory of God. God is in the glorious, holy righteousness of heaven. And in order to get there, you need sinless perfection and holiness. And because of sin, we all come short of the glory of God. New Testament. And uh, you say, well, you know, I understand that that applies to the alcoholic and that, that applies to the drug dealer. Go back to your Bible, 1 John chapter 1. And, and that applies to the guy who's a pornographer. And that applies to those uh, mass murderers. But I'm basically a good guy. I go to work every day. I take care of my family. Uh, I go to Mass. Uh, I, I, I belong at church. I've been baptized. Uh, you know, I'm not in that category. I don't need that type of redemption. Uh, 1 John uh, chapter 1, uh, verse 8. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. You know what sin he's talking about there. It says, The Lord Jesus Christ, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away... Notice it said the sin of the world. It didn't say the sins of the world. It said the sin. Do you know what the sin is? It's the sin nature. It's that sin that's woven as part of the warp and the woof of the very fabric of everybody born down here that's born in Adam. In the image and likeness of the Father, Adam. The one going all the way back to the garden. The one that sinned against God. That's the sin he's talking about. The sin nature. That's what Jesus can take away. The sin nature. Well, I don't have any sin. If you don't think you have a sin nature, you're deceiving yourself. You're deceiving yourself. So, redemption through the blood, the need is definitely there. Now, the provision, the provision is right there. We've seen the need. 
Now the provision, God's going to make the provision, it's going to be His blood. Jesus said, this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Go to Hebrews chapter 9, back up a few books. Hebrews chapter 9. You see, in, in, in when God had given the commandments to Moses, when God had begun to reveal Himself to the people, when God had even showed Noah, and, and Noah found grace in his eyes, He said, you know, they've all corrupted themselves down here. And no matter what commandments I give them, they break them. So I've got to find a way in my mercy to preserve them from perdition and destruction. Because the wages of sin is death. And not just death of the body, but death of the soul. So, I'm going to make a way. I'm going to show you a covenant of blood, Moses, whereby you will cover the people's sins with blood. Verse 22, Hebrews 9.22, And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. Without the shedding of blood is no remission. Redemption is going to be through Christ's blood. But notice, it couldn't be the blood of bulls and goats. Going back in that same chapter, verse 12, Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he, Jesus, entered once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Eternal redemption through his blood. The, the best the goats and the bulls could do is give a temporary redemption, covering the sins of the flesh, but it couldn't purge the soul, the inner man, the conscience. All it could do would be just cover the sins of the flesh for the people. And they still lived with the sin stain on their soul. Verse 4, 13. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of the heifer sprinkling to the unclean sanctifies to the purifying of the flesh, that's all it could cleanse was their flesh. But watch this, verse 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit, there's two parts of the Godhead, offered Himself without spot to God. There's a third part of the Godhead. Purge your conscience. There's your soul being cleaned. The redemption to pay for the price of the sins and the stain of sin on your soul can only be through His blood. Only through His blood. His blood was a, a special blood. How am I doing on time, Joe? His blood was a special blood. Let me show you. Go back to Psalm 49. Look in the Old Testament. I'll show you something here. Very interesting. You say, well, if the wages of sin is death, well, then, then I, I'll pay... I'll die, and my sin debt has been paid. Yeah, the death of your body pays for the sin debt in your flesh, for all the sins of the flesh you've committed. But God is a spirit. And Jesus says, okay, you may not have committed adultery with the woman, so you don't have the, the sin on your body of adultery, but if you've lusted after her in your heart, then you've committed adultery in your heart and in your soul and in your spirit, and God is a spirit. And so you've got a stain there. How are you going to pay for that one? With the death of your soul. Psalm 49. Um, excuse me. Psalm, yeah, Psalm 49. Picking it up in verse uh, 6. They that trust in their wealth and boast themselves in the multitude of their riches. Not just material wealth. What about religious wealth? I've always done, like the good rich young ruler. I've kept the commandments. I've gone to church. I've been a church member. I've certainly built up a bank account of good deeds before God. I've got a wealth of good deeds before God. Well, certainly when I stand before God, the wealth of my good deeds will overcome the few puny bad deeds I've done. I haven't done that many, you know. I've never made a graven image. Okay, that's one commandment. Verse 6. They that trust in their wealth and boast themselves in the multitude of their riches, verse 7, none of them can by any means redeem his brother, nor give to God a ransom for him for the redemption of their soul is precious. It ceaseth forever. The soul is an eternal thing. You need, you need eternal blood to pay for it. It can't be a man's blood. A man's blood is temporary blood. You, you need eternal blood. Go to Psalm 146. Watch this very carefully. This is a very interesting, perplexing verse. I have to pray about this one. Psalm 146. Verse 1, Praise ye the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. Again, the importance of the soul. The salvation of the soul. While I live, I will praise the Lord. I will sing praises unto God 
while I have any being. Watch this, verse 3. Put not your trust in princes, nor in the Son of Man, in whom there is no help. Wait a second, time out. What was Jesus' favorite term of referring to himself as? The Son of Man. It says there's no help in the Son of Man. What, what does that mean? <laughs> what it means, if Jesus was only the Son of Man, it wouldn't have been enough. He also had to be the Son of God. His blood's a very special blood. He just didn't have man's blood percolating through there. He had to be God's son. What does that mean? Well, Matthew chapter 1. If he was just a son of man, he couldn't have helped any of us. If he had been born of Joseph and Mary, we're all dead in trespasses and sins. Matthew chapter 1. Verse 18, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Verse 20, And while he thought on these things, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take Mary thy wife unto thee, for that which is conceived in her of us is of the Holy Ghost. Thou shalt, she shall bring forth a son, thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel. Which being interpreted as God with us. The Son of Man couldn't have helped us. Had to be the Son of God. He had to be God with us. He had to have not man's blood in his veins. He had to have God's blood. Turn to Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. When he shed his blood, he shed precious blood. The redemption for your soul is his blood alone. And there is no other redemption. And that means the virgin birth. And that means the sinless life. And that means God's blood in his veins. Acts chapter 20, Paul's preaching to the church at Ephesus and he says in verse 28, Take heed, therefore unto yourselves, and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which He hath purchased with His own blood. Who? God. That's God's blood. Redemption is only through His blood. Now, so we saw A, there was a need. We saw B, there's provision. The need is we're sinners. The provision equals the Savior. Virgin born, sinless life, God's blood in His veins. How does A meet B? How does that redemption through His blood apply? Does it mean since He died on the cross and He said, this is My blood of the New Testament which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Well, gee, many are on the broad way. Does that mean they're saved? Mm, not exactly. Go back to Romans 3. Turn to the next book after Acts, Romans 3. We saw the need in verse 23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Look at verse 24. But you're justified freely. Here's the tree of life. God says, eat freely from the tree of life. Freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. There's your redemption. Watch it. Verse 25. Whom God hath set forth to be propitiation. That's full payment. How? Through faith in His blood. Through faith. A meets B when you have faith. That's how it meets. Faith in His blood. Not faith in church membership. Not faith in sacraments. Not faith in baptism. Not faith in the Pope. There's no hope in the Pope. Not faith in a saint. God trusteth not his own saints. Not faith in... i got a relative that she's a nun, she's a priest, she's praying for me, he's praying for me. No, no. It comes faith, your personal faith, in the blood shedding of Jesus Christ on Calvary's cross for the redemption for the sins of your soul. That's it. That's the only way. Uh, Romans 5, verse 1. Therefore, being justified by faith. Be justified by faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, I just don't feel any peace. I'm still nervous. I'm still upset. Oh, maybe you haven't placed your faith 100% in Jesus. I'm still afraid of death. 
Well, you needn't be if you've placed your faith in Jesus. He's conquered death. You have peace with God. You're not going to meet God as a judge. You're going to meet Him as Savior if you've placed your faith. A plus B, you got faith. you got to have faith. Or A never meets B. There can be a big division between the two. Look at Acts chapter 13, going back to Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13. This is a great uh, preaching at, at Antioch and Pisidia. One of the great uh, messages given, a great sermon to study from ver verses 14 on. But look at, uh, as he winds it up in verse uh, 38. He's been preaching about Jesus Christ and the resurrection, the shedding of blood, the resurrection. And then he says, Be it known unto you therefore, men and brethren, he's talking to Jews and Gentiles, that through this man... Jesus Christ is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins and by Him all that believe are justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. The law can't save anyone, my Jewish brethren. Men, Gentiles, the law couldn't save them, it can't save you. It's by faith, it's by belief. The Old Testament was a testament of works. The New Testament is a testament of faith. This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many. Uh, do this in remembrance of me. By faith, remembering what I did at Calvary. It's redemption. The first fundamental of the faith, the Christian faith, is redemption through His blood. I'm a Bible-believing, born-again Christian, but there's some precious fundamentals. And we're going to study. There are six more that we'll study as we go on in the next few weeks. Any questions on what we looked at today? Yes? The fu the yes, they are. A fundamentalist today has thrown out the authorized version of the Bible. Today, the evangelical uses the NIV and the fundamentalist uses the New American Standard Bible, the Scholar's Bible. Well, okay. Well, let's understand. You've taken a, per a term to yourself and applied a meaning to it, and that's okay. You can apply that meaning to it. You you can. Yeah, okay. Well, yes, but but the men I mentioned, some of the men I mentioned, are fundamentalists, and the men that wrote that book are fundamentalists, and they wrote a four-volume set on the fundamentals, and you can see they didn't believe in the word of the, the Lord. They believed in a, a dead. They got a like. They say we have a stone pope. You know, it's a dead old Bible from years and years and years ago. We have the, I believe we have the living Word of God, which is alive right now today. This is what speaks to me. This is how I uh, hear from the Lord. This is uh, what en 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 energizes my prayer. This is what puts the Spirit in me that allows me to teach and preach this way, is the living Word of the Lord. Apart from this, I'd have nothing. I'd really have nothing to except, oh, Jesus is the Savior. I'd be like an evangelical. No, I'm a Bible-believing, born-again Christian. And a Bible-believer means that there's a Bible in English. Someone who believes in something in Hebrew and Greek is not a Bible-believer. He's an original believer, which doesn't even exist. That's the way I see it. Let's pray, Father. I understand these things are hard to grasp because there is so much confusion in Christianity today. Uh, people have been using terms, Lord, like you said, except we be born again and as children... And believe that all Scripture is given by you, Lord. How can, we, how can we truly be Christians that will be energized and empowered by your Spirit? Lord, please uh, help us to understand these things. Uh, thank you that you've kept the wall up in the New Jerusalem. You've kept the shield of faith up for us. You've preserved your words. Help as we study them to study these precious gemstones of what we might call the fundamentals of the faith. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I mean, I didn't define it, man.